if you believe in Bitcoin, you don't buy 3%. You buy 100%, you get the max debt you can get in fiat terms, and you also use that proceeds to buy more Bitcoin. I really love that you said that El Salvador is not bullish enough. Bitcoin is always, always going to be the money of the free world, of the people who opt out of that system. So they're just going to change from government issue to corporate issue. You're going to, Amazon is going to buy a country and people who live on the Amazon country, they only circulate with Amazon money. Apple is going to buy a country for themselves. People who live there have their Apple houses, Apple watches, Apple cars, Apple everything. Oh. <laughs> I never heard that. Companies have much more strength to survive than countries. Especially when we move to a digital world. We don't need to be so controlled by problems. We can have our own schools, our own health system. We can have private roads and we can go from there. Hi Marcel, how are you doing? Everything fine on your end? Hi Robin, uh, everything good down here from Brazil. Uh, I think there's a little bit disappointing news from Mexico. I heard this morning, but it's life. What, what, what's the disappointing news from, from Mexico? There was a, a socialist a president, a woman that happened to be a woman, a socialist president that happened to be elected today. So when you think about Latin America, these things don't happen uh, uh, by chance or by par hazard. It's like, it's the whole block that is moving to the socialist side. So I'm kind of sad, saddened by that. Not that I'm left winger or right winger. I, I, I don't care. I'm libertarian. I don't care for politics, but it's sad to see when Latin America is heading that way. I totally agree with, uh, with you. And uh, there's too much politish, uh, politics going on. I feel like in, in this year, it's like American election, European Union uh, has the election. Austria has European Union and Austrian national election. Wow. Uh, so uh, for me, year? it's like this year. Yeah. Yes. It's like three months uh, difference. It's we have next, like we have next Sunday, the election uh, for the European Union. And we have then three months later, the Austrian national <laughs> uh, election. Uh, so for me, in my situation, it's like just too much politi politics right now. I, I, I focus does more the president on the president have actual power? Like, can he change things by himself or he needs approval from Congress and Senate and whatever? How in Austria? Work in Austria, yeah. Yeah, uh, um, it's not the presidential election uh, in Austria. It's the Congress. I, I don't know how it's called actually in English, but but it's the nas uh, national parliament that is okay. uh, voted for. And this is the one. The, this is the uh, instance that actually has the power to vote for everything, like whatever okay. uh, is coming into coming from the government as a suggestion. The parliament has to vote for it. Uh, so, but the, pres the president of Austria has little to no, uh, power. Okay. He, he, he earns good money. He's a representative figure in, in Austria, but when it comes to actual, um, power, it's not really, uh, Im Im important, uh, for, for, for the actual influence for the laws. It's more like, uh, when, when there's a new government, the president picks the person or the party who first tries to build a government, uh, but he cannot really do anything in that. Like he, he, he's more representative. <laughs> okay. Uh, here in Brazil, it's kind of similar to the United States. Uh, we have a president. He has some kind of power. Yeah. But the issue is that if he stays for longer than four years, if he's reelected and in our case, the, current president had been reelected in the past. He has already been president for eight years. Now he's, he's got four more. So not 12 in a row, but 12 in total. So we had another president in between. But the issue is that this president was the one who elected all the guys from the, the, the Supreme Courts. So any ruling that people say, no, that's inconstitutional, the president cannot uh, sign on that. He just say, okay, let's decide, the, let's let the Supreme Court rule. And the Supreme Court will always favor this president because he was the one who picked these guys 10 years ago. So uh, it's kind of living in a monarchy. It's, it's crazy. Whatever he wants, <laughs> he can do.
even if it's not <laughs> constitutional. It's fascinating to see politics. It's like in Austria, it's also uh, the president is usually there for 12 years because one period is six years. Uh, and it's like almost always, I think there was rarely an instant where the president cannot be reelected and the maximum is two periods. So okay. six by two, uh, and almost every president, I don't even know if there was ever a president who was not 12 years there. Uh, he, he's there for 12 years and usually it's a really old guy. Like the president uh, is, is usually, uh, uh, older guys, uh, but I'm, I'm not as, uh, um, keen to, to talk about Austrian uh, history of, of politics. I know a little bit about the last like five years because I was uh, engaged in the Austrian politics a lot. But then with Bitcoin, my focus shifted a lot towards Bitcoin and, and uh, less towards uh, politics. Is it also on your side? Like, uh, are, are yeah. you? How do you see politics when you have Bitcoin? I used to support the liberal candidates and the liberal parties in Brazil. I used to give them money, go out on rallies and stuff like that. But I felt like, dude, we're not making a change. There's like in the lower house, there's 520 congressmen. Like even if we elect 20, which is going to be a miracle, it's not going to change anything. But we, because we're going to be less than 5% of the lower house. And on the, on the upper house, the Senate, there are like 22 senators. If we elect one or two, it will be a miracle. So we're not going to make a change from there. So I found out about Bitcoin. Well, I find out. I started to, to, to accumulate some Bitcoin and, and I'll talk about that later. But I started my life in Bitcoin in 2017. So like six months later, I was thinking to myself, well, if there's a way to change the government and more importantly, to change what people understand and perceive about the government. I'm not talking about only fiat money. It could be gold, could be the, the, the base money, I don't care. But people think that they, there's no way out from the government system. They think, no, our only way to get representatives is on the vote. There's no way out. Either we vote for the left or for the right, or for the center, there's no... Uh, for viable option. We cannot tell them, ah, I don't agree with this system. You should not be taking 50% of my earnings to do whatever I, I, I don't want. So after I really understood Bitcoin and it took like six to eight months after I started in 2017, then I said, it makes no longer sense to be involved in politics in any way. Even if it's to say, I don't trust this system, I don't like this system, we should look for alternatives. Then I understood that if we change the money, if we don't no longer let the power of the money printer with the governments, then their money, it's automatically over. They're going to be like your presence. Yeah, they can sign, they can go to ceremonies, and et cetera, but they don't have the money to do, to build the roads and to do hospitals and do everything saying to the people, yeah, we're helping you. We're, we're the good guys. We're the government. Without us, we, there wouldn't be streets. There wouldn't be ambulance. There wouldn't be schools. So when people perceive, understand that the, the money, the, the powers on the money side and the best way to cut them out of the job is to search for alternative money transmitting systems, then I said, I'm out of politics. Uh, it, 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 it's it's um, for me similar. Uh, the only thing that changed is the last six to eight months, I heard so many stories about El Salvador and Nayib Bukele gave me a little bit hope that there, if, if there is a really good guy who, who could actually do something, uh, it, it, it's possible to move something in a country. And I don't know if this will ever be possible in other, other countries. I don't know if long term this will even be good for El Salvador. Like I, I like the direction where they are going, but nobody knows how it will look in 10 years. Like El Salvador came from a really shitty place, but they're moving in a good direction. Mm -hmm. But how will this look in 10 years? But for what I see, it gives me a little bit, <laughs> a little bit hope back in politics, but, but maybe I'm, I'm dreaming. Are you talking mostly about the climate and the, the, how it affects people as society, 
the, the day-to-day living or as the economy, GDP, and et cetera, the big numbers? Or how is the quality of life of the small people? What, what do you think that changed most? I think in El Salvador, uh, the 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 biggest thing that I mean, I was never there. Like that's I, I have to I oh, yeah. have to say that I I interviewed like 10, 15 people already on the podcast who uh, moved there from other countries or was or were already there and they are currently living in, in in El Salvador. So I think I have some grasp on the on what's going on in El Salvador, but not a full grasp because I never was really there. Um, and the biggest thing I always hear from people when they talk about El Salvador who were actually there is the main thing that happened is security. Uh, they, they said like there are less security guards in front of the stores. Uh, they f- have a, a higher subjective feeling of security in the country. Um, and they, they see um, a li- like El Salvadorians are more proud Uh, again about businesses about s- stuff like that so because they can all of a sudden i, I know this, this this one story who was told to me um where a guy had a shop for signs like he sold signs and he did not even have a sign because he was robbed so many times so, so only people who could find him uh when, when they actually kn- actually knew him Uh, but because he did not have a sign, nobody could see him. But now he has no security guards. He uh, can put the signs up, and there's uh, a lower risk of of being robbed. So I think security is the main thing. It has nothing to do with Bitcoin, actually. Uh, I don't. I don't think it has something to do with Bitcoin. Maybe uh, I'm wrong, but uh, this is the main thing I always hear from El Salvadorians that that, that actually changed. Yeah, I think I, I, the main concern I have is the same as you. Yeah. Criminality went down. There's more a lot of foreign, uh, uh, not only tourists, but people willing to do business there because criminality went down. But I don't think that has anything to do with Bitcoin. And when you ask the locals if they are transacting in Bitcoin, no, they, they, they aren't. They, they accept Bitcoin via their Chivo wallet or whatever app, but it's automatically converted to US dollars. So it's still a dollarized economy. I don't think it changed much when you think about GDP terms on how you can take people out of poverty and stuff like that. If those things happen, and I think they did, it's because of crime stopping measures. He put 1% of the people in jail or whatever, but it has little to do with Bitcoin, especially when you check that very few of them effectively save in Bitcoin They're mostly transacting in US dollars using the Bitcoin Lightning Network or whatever, but transacting in dollars and saving in dollars, not saving Bitcoin. So I don't think that Bitcoin is the uh, the biggest thing happening there. The biggest thing happening there, as you said, is more a, a focused uh, a president or country that said, we're going to stop criminality. Maybe not the big narco traffickers, but at least the, the, the small guys, we're going to make the streets more safe. So yeah, it's a good thing. I think it's good that he's inviting other presidents from around the world to discuss about Bitcoin and why the country is investing in Bitcoin. But if you check the country's uh, total reserves, he only, last time I checked, he invested like 4% of the reserves in Bitcoin. Yeah, it's like, I don't know, $250 million. Yeah, yeah, but the country's reserve is like 10 times more than that because they have oil production. Uh, so the reserves are still in gold, in US treasures or in uh, uh, shares of companies or whatever, but it's less than 5% last time I checked that was in Bitcoin. So I think, yeah, it's a small step. It's in the right direction, but I don't think that's gonna be the what's gonna explode Bitcoin adoption from for the population and for other governments. The other governments will go there and say, well, this is promising. I want to copy this, this, this. Maybe I'm going to allocate 1% of my reserves to Bitcoin, not 3% or 4% like you did. So, yeah, it's positive, but I don't think that's the the biggest ad, biggest advertisers for Bitcoin success. I don't think so. Uh, absolutely. And, and uh, I always uh, try to mention that 
Bitcoin does not need El Salvador, definitely like uh, El Salvador has not a huge impact uh, on, on Bitcoin right now, at least. Um, if Bit El Salvador gets to be a really great success story uh, and it can like, it, it all started with when they adopted Bitcoin and in 10 years, they're like a really rich country because Bitcoin companies come in there, maybe talents come in there. And that's like one thing uh, that we did not mention till now is like, it had some marketing effects. Like uh, we, we talk now about uh, El Salvador, uh, which we probably would not do if they would not have to do anything with, with, with Bitcoin. So it has some some marketing effects, uh, but the long-term uh, success of that is not only depending on Bitcoin, it's uh, on depending on the um, execution of them being able to get people the skilled people into the country and good companies in the country to actually really uh, do it. Or do you see it differently? I think that I like the micro strategy way. If you believe in Bitcoin, you don't buy 3%. You buy 100%, you get the max debt you can get in fiat terms, and you also use that proceeds to buy more Bitcoin. It's not allocating 5% or 10% in your reserves that you're going to catapult a small, poor country to a, a top 40 or top 50 economy. It, it's not going to happen that way. Uh, uh, so Brazil, for, take Brazil, for example. We don't have external debt. We paid that long ago. We're even creditors to the FMI. But believe it or not, 100% of our reserves, we have $300 billion reserves. 100% of them are allocated in U.S. treasuries. And I, I got to remind you that the current sitting president and most of Brazilians as well are more aligned with Russia and China than with the United States. We have several issues on the, how to say, the, the world, we call it ONU, the world organization where they, they vote if they're going to support Palestinians or Israelis, if, they, if they're going to voter if you're gonna sanction the Russians. Every time Brazil votes against sanctioning Russians, against sanctioning China, against sanctioning Palestine, or uh, Brazil is uh, never aligned the United States on those questions. And yet, 100% of money is in US Treasury. It, it, it really makes no sense. They're waiting for a, 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 a problem, when a day when United States go, is gonna sell, is gonna say, hey, Either you start voting with us, you, you are one of the 20 biggest economies in the world. So if you, you're going to start work, working with us or we're going to confiscate this money. We're, if we're not six months into that, we're three or four years. But Brazil is doing the dumbest thing they can do. It's, uh, I, never, I never heard that. I'm, 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 I'm not that good with macro uh, themes, but I really love that you said that El Salvador is not bullish enough <laughs> because <laughs> I also see it like that. Four uh, percent is so almost. I mean, it's a, an interesting strategy. It's more like a marketing and sim, uh, symbolic gag when they invest like one Bitcoin a day, and you see in the nice charts uh, and they make it public. Uh, but obviously, four percent is is not a lot. There are many individuals uh maybe even like watching now that have more bitcoin than them uh, not many but there are there are some individuals that have, have more than than than, than whole salvador so uh it, it it's interesting uh, to see this all playing out um the first topic that i actually wanted to get into uh, that i actually had <laughs> planned for today um was when I went to, I always go to Twitter profiles of, of, of people uh, because Twitter is like my, my main main platform that I am. And I loved your the banner with the Joker picture where it says like, it's not about the money, it's about the message. I, I love that so much. Uh, and just to, to enter here, um, what, what, what do you think is the, like the main message uh, about Bitcoin and why is it so important? I think I used to be... Uh... I don't know if you call it in English liberal, but not, not center, not left, not right. I think we should have the least government possible. They should not be intervening on our lives. Uh, but prior to joining Bitcoin, uh, I used to support those movements and thinking, well, maybe if we elect 10 officials or 20 officials, we're going to be able to make change. And then I, when it, after I understood Bitcoin, 
and I saw its potential, not only as a digital gold or whatever, because we're usually dragged by the potential of getting rich. We shouldn't uh, uh, try to hide this. I entered Bitcoin. I really entered Bitcoin because I thought, well, this can go to a million dollars, two million dollars. I'm going to get rich. Uh, but after seven, seven years, you can see that I still live on the same house and nothing changed, so I, I'm not rich. Uh, but the thing is, I understood that if we want to change the system, we need to give the population a tool that it's easy and that they can see some benefit. Uh, people are not going to change because of, of a 5x benefit. Well, the, you have the, the, your do digital dollar, the Tether or the USDC coin, but Bitcoin is better because it's more decentralized and you don't need an intermediate. Uh, and if the US government wants to confiscate it, the, the tethers or the, US, the USDC coins, they can take the treasuries or the, the money in the bank and they're gonna lose money. People don't really care for that. 95% of the people right now, they don't care for that. Even if it's a five time better, they're, they're not gonna change from the system. They do believe that the US dollar is relatively stable as an economy, they have a strong army to defend their interests and etc. They do believe in the Euro region because it's like 20 countries. They can somehow, if United States, I'm not, not going to support Europe anymore. You're going to have to buy things from China and Russia. Europe can manage it. So people believe they have the wrong perception that their money is going to be there in 20 year time because the government or whatever or the army is going to be there to support them. But once you implement, for, for example, the CBDC and the government tells the guy, well, you can only travel abroad two times because of carbon footprint. Oh, you can only buy two kilos of meat every month. Otherwise, we're going to block your money. You can only, it's CBDC. We can tell you what you can buy or what you cannot buy. Or you, you, you like Pornhub and you pay a sub subscription, but we don't think here in Austria people should be paying for porn, it's not cool. So I'm going to avoid payments to Pornhub or whatever you do. So when you make, when you force, when you push the little guy out of his limits, I don't think that Bitcoiners are uh, uh, representative of the population. People who are already in Bitcoin and already in crypto already had a, a predisposal to be more angry with what the government do. But most of the populations, my cousins, my father, my, my, my mother, my uncle, they, they think that, well, maybe we don't need the government, but the other way it's anarchy. It's gonna be much worse. We're gonna have the militias, it's gonna become like Honduras, people with guns on the streets and etc. And we've seen countries in Latin America that went that way because of, but those militias were funded by the CIA and et cetera. We know that there's no way a couple of five guys in Honduras happen to have Land Rovers and 50 caliber guns and et cetera. They don't have money for that. Somebody gave them, uh, somebody trained them. So uh, we know that this is CIA funded. This is the fiat money problem. It's not going to happen in Brazil. We are kind of a poor country, like 60% of our population live with less than, I don't know, $150, $180 a month. 60% of the population live with less than $180 a month. We are a really poor country. At the same time, we have 20% of the population or 10% of the population at least that lives with, I don't know, $4,000 or over. We have both. We have a really rich country here, I don't know, 20 million people. And we have 120 million people who are extremely poor. And the rest is the middle class. But we have both sides here. So I don't think that the, the guys who are getting four or $5,000 per month are worried about any of that. They have the cars. They can travel. They can go to restaurants. Their life is good. They're not going to complain. They're not going to try to overthrow governments. They're not going to try to... to create a different uh, fiat, a different payment system, whether in gold or Bitcoin, they're not just, their life's good. So I think that the, what's gonna be the game changer is when the little guy, the middle class, who now can travel, who now can do stuff, buy stuff online, or go to restaurants and enjoy his leisure time, 
when the government forces him and say, no, you cannot do that because of carbon footprint. You cannot do that because of the new COVID. You cannot do that because we're not friendly to the United States anymore. So you cannot go to Disney. You cannot subscribe to Amazon, to, to, to whatever you like. You're not going to be able to do that. Then this guy is going to look for an alternative. Then this guy is going to come begging for Bitcoin. It doesn't matter if the price is $60,000 or $600,000. He's opting out of the fiat system. But we need something to push him out. And on the other side, we also need a better UX for the average user. They're not going to be able to write down seeds and stuff like that and wallets. I don't think that's for the majority. I think that's the backbone that should happen uh, uh, without the user knowing that he has wallets, he has seeds, etc. Maybe some I monitor, I don't know, but we should have easier solutions for the most of the population. Right now, it's a good back backend system. It's not ready for mainstream. If you are listening to this podcast, you might be wondering what is actually the setup look like of Robin or how can I improve my Bitcoin setup? And there's two things. You have to buy Bitcoin from the right source and you have to store Bitcoin the right way. Let's focus on the first thing, how to buy Bitcoin. It's simple. Have a Bitcoin only exchange. Don't deal with the shitcoin exchanges. Don't deal with an exchange that has an own token or something like that. Be on a Bitcoin only exchange. I use 21 Bitcoin. 21 Bitcoin is for me the best partner for that. And now where do you store Bitcoin? Bitcoin should be stored on a hardware wallet, on a self custody solution where you yourself hold your keys and it should be a cold wallet. So that's my simple solutions. That's a bit box. You just put your Bitcoin on there, back up your seed phrase, and you are better than 95% of all Bitcoin hodlers. If you have more than a thousand euros in Bitcoin, it's an absolutely must have. One last thing before we get back to the video. I'm really passionate about meeting other Bitcoiners. And there's an amazing opportunity in the middle of Europe in June, the Bitcoin Prague Conference. It's the best and biggest Bitcoin only conference in whole of Europe. For all Americans, please visit Europe and visit this place in June. For all Europe's, it's a must go anyways. You are so close to the Bitcoin Prague conference, you basically have to come. I will do interviews there and I would love to meet you all there. Use code ROBIN for all my sponsors to get discounts and use the links down in the description. Yeah, definitely. We, we, we are so early and I say that so many times, like we need so much more development, especially on the, on the front end uh, side of things, because um, like when we compare it to the internet revolution, what's happened with, uh, with email, for example, in the early days of email, everybody thought uh, the, everybody will run an own email server. Nobody runs their own email, so everybody's on, on, on Gmail, which leads me a little bit to the, to the next question. Like, how, how will this Bitcoin adoption, do you think, will, will, will end up? Is, is self-custody? Uh, I mean, we know that main chain, like uh, on-chain transactions uh, will be a thing of like maybe 5 million, maybe 10 million institutions or individuals, because mm -hmm. at some point you will be priced out, uh, but will be self-custody, uh, and something uh, that we on, on this privacy and coin mixing and all the stuff that goes on uh, right now with hardcore Bitcoiners, will this be always like a niche thing because the majority just does not care <laughs> about those things? I don't know if you know the history of the computer bulletin board systems, CBBS. I used to own one in Brazil. Uh, we, I had a, a computer in my, my home, four computers with four modems, each one and 16 lines of telephone, 16 landlines. So people would call to my server at my house so they could chat, they could share games, profiles, games online, stuff like that. So that's prior to the internet. We call that CBBS, Computer Bulletin Board System. That used to be my one run until 1996, I think. My father started in 1980s. 84 or 85 he worked for two years then we had a hiatus of six years then i come back in i don't know 90 so i ran for another five years and i would show that to my friends and they, they said well it's interesting but i'm gonna need to buy a modem 
I cannot use the landline phone from my house because my dad is going to be angry with me if I'm on the phone on the modem all the time. Uh, I like the games, but the games are a little bit text-based. And to download the file, it takes like two days. I can go downstairs and buy the, the, the CD with the game in, in five minutes. So people saw the technology. They said, well, it's good. It's promising, but it doesn't work for me. So out of, I don't know, 50 friends, I had two of them who also enjoyed to use my BBS. And we go to, to meetings and we talk online and we play these text-based games and etc. Then all of a sudden in 1997, the internet came to Brazil or came to the broader part of the population. So everything changed. Everybody was using the IR, uh, IRC or IC key, messaging chats. Everybody was using file transferring sets, protocols like torrent and FTPS to download games and etc. That the, everybody was playing games online. Even it was Doom or simple games that was not very complex game, but let's graphic games. So it was basically the same thing that we had been doing for the past years, for the past 10 years, they were starting to do on the internet. It's like WhatsApp in Brazil, like everybody has WhatsApp. The maid, the nanny, my father, my grandfather, everybody has WhatsApp because it's easy to use. Yeah, there's encryption in WhatsApp. There's WhatsApp Pay, they can send money in, in WhatsApp. I, and probably there's even an app that you can integrate a lightning wallet to WhatsApp. It's going to read your message and send ma money to you. Send 10,000 sets to Robin, please. It's going to connect with my wallet and do it. So yeah, there's lots of technology in there, but people, for them, it's an easy app to do. So what I think for Bitcoin, that sometime in the future, there'll be a more integration to the apps that they're already used to. And the wallet will be connected so transparent that they don't even know that they are using a Bitcoin wallet. Where, where would you say uh, are we in this uh, in this development? I feel like uh, when we compare it to the internet um, revolution, we are. I feel like before the 2000.com bubble, where a lot of things started, uh, but it's hard to say where exactly we are. What would you say we are, where we are? I would say we are on the, we're not on the internet era, era yet. That's what I'm talking. We are not into 1997. We're still in 1993, 1994, because to use, you have to learn how to use the seeds. You have to learn how to manage to send on chain to off chain and etc. You have to learn about custody. It's not, it's not going to cut for 95% of the population. We're not going to get to 10%. You know that the graph that the chasm adoption, there's a chance between 9 and 11%. We're not going to cross the chasm until we have a much better UX. And it's not like a, a faster wallet or cheaper transactions. It ain't any, anything like that. We need stuff that the regular, my, my maid, my nanny, they can use without even knowing how the technology works. They just select, yeah. well, out of my paycheck, I want 5% to be invested in Bitcoin. <laughs> That's it. They're not going to do anything more than that. I think even sometimes that um, people will not even really know that Bitcoin is is underneath everything. Uh, it, it will be like more like the TCP/IP protocol, where people like, uh, yeah, I know that when I send my WhatsApp message and it gives this little text that yeah, it, he got it. But how many people can actually explain what's going on in the background? How this message is actually sent to the other client? So uh, yeah, it's it. It will be really interesting and um, I, I always try to educate everybody around me about self-custody, about all the Bitcoin things, also about the nerdy stuff just because I'm passionate about, but I know it will probably, as I see it and as you see it, uh, it will be not something that everybody does, but it's great that we have that uh, possibility and have this transparency and have this control for those people who actually want that. And this is uh, one thing that uh, that really is is cool. How is um, uh, in uh, as we do talked a little bit about Brazil? How is the adoption going in there? As Brazil is a country that <laughs> would need Bitcoin a lot, uh, as every country, but uh, Brazil also. There was an interesting research that came out uh, I don't know one or two months ago, uh, done by the brokerage, the, the tra traditional brokerage. They found out that about 
I don't know, six or seven million Brazilians have traditional investments, either funds or share stocks or government bonds, like seven million. And the number of Brazilians uh, playing a video, I don't know how to call the sp not only sporting bets, but betting, betting applications that you have casinos, that you have dice, that you have sports or whatever, was 21 million Brazilians. So it's three times more Brazilians going on bets, sports bets or casinos and etc. online versus investing on whatever funds, uh, bonds or stocks. So it's, it's not fair to say that Brazilians do not have money to invest or they do not have the education or they do not have the, 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 the mobile phones or anything. They have all of that. They know how to use it. But they don't see that investing is going to take them from poverty to being uh, medium class or from going from middle class to being rich. They think, oh, that's only for uh, wealthy people. It's a rigged game. I'm not... It's not worthy for me. But when you try to explain Bitcoin, well, Bitcoin opposes everything like that. It's more like a digital real estate or digital oil or whatever you try to explain. And, and the guy says, well, but what can I buy with Bitcoin? They're, they're really focused on short term. Uh, what's the potential gain for the next two months? And I say, potentially you're going to lose 50% because of volatility. And that's how it works. So if you're not ready to lose 50%, you're never going to get the, the 5x gains in, in 5 to 10 years. They're not interested in it because they're too focused on short term. So, the, and the big question is, why cannot they uh, uh, create a, a, a small account with 100 reais or $20 every month and just sit and wait? Because they learned via 40 years of fiat money that, that if you put money on an investment or you put money under the couch in 20 year time, that money is going to be worthless. They, they were uh, uh, forced to change their mentality to either I spend the money over the next six months or I invest in something really risky if I want to do a, a 5x. They're really afraid of having money sitting on an investment for 20 or 20 years, 10 or 20 years, even if it's government bonds or stocks, because in the past, the government has already confiscated money that was sitting in the banks. In the past, our fixed income that used to pay, I don't know, 40% per year, suddenly, because of a rule change, was paying like half of that, because the government said, well, we're going to be broke, so we're going to need to change the law, so... From now on, we're going to pay less on the treasury bonds. So we had those, not that those happened over the last 20 years. They did not, okay? In the past 20 years, our only problem was inflation go going from 4% to, I don't know, 12, 13% or 15 or whatever. Uh, but money confiscation happened over 20 years ago. So people are afraid of doing anything that I tell them. You're going to have to sit and wait 10 years for Bitcoin. He's not going to do it because he doesn't trust fiat. He doesn't trust government. And he doesn't understand that Bitcoin is completely apart from it. Hey, it it's funny for me how uh, when I speak with people, and I love that uh, example with the online gambling uh, and, and with the, the traditional finance, because when I speak with people, the, the one person that the, the, those persons who are playing the lottery are those persons who say Bitcoin is too risky uh, and have all those like concerns about it. And I was like, how, <laughs> like literally like when you bet a 10 euro and it's like, oh, but it's only 10 euros. But yeah, how, how often are you doing it? And I see a lot of lottery players. They play the lottery usually uh, regularly. They don't like, oh, I play one once a year or like I, I, I play like I, I did once and never did it again. They usually play like every month, some even every day, some even every week. And when you play like every week with two, three euros, uh, put those two, three euros, uh, like for example, when we, when we take this example with Bitcoin, because I know the numbers actually, uh, when you would have put 10 euros a week, the last 10 years in Bitcoin, this would be an investment of 5,200 uh, euros, but it would be 
a total value now of over 300,000 euros. And, and this 10 euros, a lot of people are just gambling on lottery tickets to might get a big win of like 2 million. But this win of 2, two million, the chances are so low. Slim, and they, yeah. they, they will never happen for you. <laughs> <laughs> Never. There's one yeah. guy that, that, that they happen to, but it, the, the chances are so low. It's not a risky bet. Like there's, there's not even a risky bet. It's an impossible bet. Uh, what would you taking? Just take like 10 euros out of, of, out of your salary every week and put it in something that is not risky, <laughs> like, like, like Bitcoin. But yeah, it's, it's, it's fascinating for me how, how, how people see that. How, how do you, um, what do you think do we have to overcome that the mainstream is adopting Bitcoin? Is, is it just a price action uh, that, uh, that we have to see? But what, what, what is it? I think, first of all, the UX. But I, like I said, it's like how WhatsApp is today compared to what, what the computing bulletin board system used to be. You, you needed to have a modem, you need to have a, a landline, a phone line connected computer you need to dial to the computer bbs you had to pay some i don't know fees to use the bbs some of them to change message it was not easy to reach people outside of your city because calling to other regions would be more expensive in brazil but once you had internet once you had whatsapp doing a phone call or send, sending a text to a, to a guy who is 100 meters away or a thousand kilometers away, it's the same price. So it's more uh, easier and cheaper to use. But I don't think it's, if it's a lightning network getting more developed or uh, uh, more secure or another way of transaction using those federated chains, I don't think it's any of that. Okay. I think it's integrating the Bitcoin as a backbone to the current banking system or whatever people already have. So in your app account of the bank, you're going to be able to have dollars, Bitcoin, uh, Ethereum, Brazilian reais, or some token issued by the bank. The, uh, when people have more liberty, liberty to choose what they want, they're going to constantly be checking, well, hmm, if I change it from uh, 50% in dollars and 50% in reais, two years ago, if I had 10% in Bitcoin, 40% in dollar, and 50% in, in reais, I would be much more wealthier. Then this guy is going to start doing the change. When it's the, on the same app of the banking system, the one he transacts to friends, the one he pays the bills, the one he does everything. Because if we are going to expect the shops and uh, my landlord to accept Bitcoin for payment for a circular economy to happen, it's like the dog trying to wag his tail to bite his tail. The, that adoption is not happening because people see no use, then adoption is not. It, it's not gonna change if the price is $70,000 or $700,000. It's not about that. As I said, I have a good example. My mother was one of the last customers of Blockbuster in Brazil. He, he was a, a, she was a strong opponent of Netflix and streaming service, simply because she doesn't work. She's uh, retired. And the thing she like enjoys most in life is going to the supermarket, going to the pharmacy, used to go to the video club to discuss with the guys who work there about the videos she liked or not, and, and stuff like that. She likes to go to the bank. She likes to talk to the manager. But this new generation that is coming, people that have uh, less than 30, 35 years old, they, they cannot see themselves going to a video store. They not, cannot see themselves going to a bank or going to, 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 to the supermarket instead of shopping online. So we need a generational shift. Like Moses, when they took the Jews out of the slavery, he didn't walk for 40 years in the desert because of nothing. He walked because he wanted the slaves to die and to have a new generation that was already born free. So the people who are living with us are slaves to the fiat money. It's not going to be some 10x improvement that it's going to make them out of the system. Like my mother only stayed out of Blockbuster when the last shop in their neighborhood, the last v VHS tape or DVD tape closed. Otherwise, she would still be using that. I know her. 
I, I love that so much. Uh, and, and it's very true because when I talk with people, uh, there are some that are already in there and they, because they deeply research and they go in there and they were kind of primed to that whole thing. But then there are also those people who are open to it, but they're really cautious and they, they are on the verge. They're like the, 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 adopters the early adopters but like on the on the later stage i don't know what the second wave is is, is called on the, on that uh, not on that graph but there are so many people who 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 will not accept the money who's not from, from the government <laughs> any any time soon uh, and that's uh, that's kind of sad to see but i totally agree with you on on, on the retail side um is, how is that different from a nation state is because when like a nation state uh, thinks differently than, than than an individual person uh, and like El Salvador started it a little bit or but way too bearish as we discussed earlier uh, but at least they're doing something and they're public about it they they, they are like kind of starting this this game theory uh, a, a little bit how do you see that playing out on on nation states uh, buying bitcoin if it's a small nation like if brazil Tomorrow says, well, we have $300 billion. We're going to dump the treasures and buy Bitcoin or gold or Russian and Chinese stable coin or whatever. What do you think is going to happen? On the next day, the U.S. is going to cut relations with Brazil. It's going to start some kind of embargo. It's going to raise tariffs for Brazilians to export to U.S. And then the Brazilian economy will go down instead of going up because it's unimaginable to be outside, not be able to sell to the biggest economy in the world. You, Brazil would simply, they lose like, I don't know, 20% of their exports overnight or maybe even, even more. And when you talk about importing technology, we're also dependent from the United States. Well, you could see that, well, maybe in five years, China and other regions will be able to, uh, uh, to surpass this and to provide the technology, maybe. But right now, if Brazil cuts ties with the United States, we're in trouble. So I don't think they have the incentives to do that. And if they do, the economies are going to get worse and the population is going to get mad and going to go and blame Bitcoin or gold or whatever decision they do. So let's not talk about countries. Let's talk about companies. So you're the CFO of Microsoft. The company is doing well. It's one of the more most profitable companies in the world, one of the most valuables, then you raise your hand and say, well, why don't we get 10% of the reserves and allocate it to Bitcoin? You have no advantage of doing that because if that 10% doubles or triples in five year time, it's not going to be a game changer for the company, right? But if the United States in one year time says, those companies that hold, have Bitcoin are, are banned to, to, to sell to the U.S. governments or to our uh, uh, partners. That we're going to cut ties with Microsoft if you don't sell Bitcoin. So people are going to ask, but who did not study that? Who was the person who took that decision and not saw the risk? Because we're not a finance investment company. We're here to sell software or whatever. We're not here to make money from our investments. That's not our job. So this person is going to be fired. There, there's not much gain to raise in the hand and say, hey, I think Microsoft should invest 10 or 20 or 50% of our holdings in Bitcoin. That's not what the company was designed for. And how, how will this, uh, like, how, how will this then work when, when we have companies slow, like, uh, we have MicroStrategy, we have uh, even like Tesla, uh, but they are like founder led. They are really like one person can make a decision, almost like a dictator uh, where Elon Musk is on top and he says like, oh, I want Bitcoin. Those companies are probably like the ones who, who don't care about <laughs> the, the government. You don't care. <laughs> as I say. Uh, but th th those will be like just the first step. And, and then when it comes to a certain point, then the, the more companies will come. Or I think the two of them can happen se separately. The first one is the banks. JP Morgan is going to tell, well, I want 10% of my reserves allocated in Bitcoin because I have to serve those kind of clients or those kind of companies that need, need Bitcoin. I'm, I'm going to allocate 10%. Sorry, United States. I don't care. I, I don't care if you want to shut JP Morgan and go to the stocks down. You can try. You won't be able to. The government and the banks are, they have their hands tied. 
they are like a one entity. So I think banks adopting Bitcoin, maybe JP Morgan issuing his own uh, stable coin that's partially bet, bet, backed by Bitcoin, some, something like that can happen and will happen. And the other side is what I said about the middle guy, the middle class guy who is going to be forced out of the system because of CD, CBDC restrictions. So I don't think they both need to happen at the same time, but those are the biggest drivers for adoption. When the banks start having the reserves in partial of the reserves in Bitcoin, and when the middle class is cut of the financial system because of the CBDC mm. or uh, embargoes from, from government. From government. I love that actually a lot. Uh, when 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 we when we look at the, the Bitcoin adoption, it's it it it's all the factors and all the players involved make it so that it's organic, uh, and it's 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 not too fast to break anything, uh, but it it comes to the right people first <laughs> when it when it makes sense. Like it's uh, you. I always make the example with the ten the tanning when the fiat. Uh, system sinks slowly. Uh, it, you don't want the Titanic to sink too fast. You want it to sink slowly so people can actually get on the life raft, get actually uh, get on Bitcoin. I mean, uh, I actually got to know that, uh, that the Titanic took four hours to sink, which is, uh, <laughs> for me fascinating to be like, you are on the, on the, uh, sh ship and you see it four hours long sinking slowly, slowly in. It uh, has to be a ho ho horrifying uh, thing. Um, do, do you also see that the, the fiat system will always be around or is there a time in, I don't know, 500 years uh, where we don't have fiat? I, I think at least like uh, the, the near future we have it, but do, do you envision a time where there, there is just no, no fiat currency and, and governments, has, governments has to be more uh, service-based? I don't think it's going to be the end of the fiat. They're just going to change from government issue to corporate issue. You're gonna, Amazon is going to buy a country and people who live on the Amazon country, uh, they only circulate with Amazon money. Apple is going to buy a country for themselves and people who live there have their Apple houses, Apple watches, Apple cars, Apple everything, Apple uh, health insurance, Apple schools and whatever. So Bitcoin is gonna be, not going to be useful there. Bitcoin is always, always going to be the money of the free world, of the people who opt out of that system. So well, I don't care. I really want to live on a free world. I, I see the advantage of living on Apple or Amazon's world. But... It's just going to change. There's go still going to be fiat. It's not issued by the government. It's going to be issued by the companies. Wow. <laughs> I never heard that. <laughs> uh, Apple, I, Apple I think, country. I think the, the companies are have much more strength uh, 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 to survive than uh, countries. Especially when we move to a digital world. Because you can be an Apple consumer and use Apple services for everything health insurance, school, whatever, if you, if, you do, if you live in Brazil, you don't need to live in the United States for that. Apple can uh, uh, create shops here and do everything around here. Most of the things nowadays are digital. In 20 years' time, it's going to be even more worse. The kids won't go to school. They're just going to sit on some crazy shit and watch the, 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 the headset. They're going to be taught using Apple headsets so they don't go to schools anymore in 10, 20 years' time. So I think the future is going to be digital and some of the people will opt out of that system and use Bitcoin on the free world. So the, but this is then all privately owned when, when we have like uh, only Apple countries, Amazon countries and the free world, uh, it's all kind of the free world because I, I mean, I guess in the Apple world, Apple probably has a monopoly on force still. So it's like mm -hmm. kind of a sure. new form of state, but it's privately owned. Uh, interesting model. I never, never thought of that, uh, <laughs> but, but, uh, but, but I love it a lot. Um, maybe come, let's come to, to this for the end of the podcast. Let's come to, to, to the near term future. Uh, do you have any crazy predictions for 2024? Well, for Latin America, as I, I said, after the Mexican socialist president was elected, I see Latin America going to the right side to socialism 
far and far and far ahead. There's no way back. There's no turning back from that. Having said that, there's a lot of people in Latin America that are getting angry with the government. They're not no longer going to support the left, right, the center, the, the liberals. They, they don't care for any of that. They want to live their lives. So I think in the near term, some countries, maybe like El Salvador, will have the bright idea, why don't we invite, we invite those people in, give them a visa, they're engineers, they're doctors, they know how to work, they're restaurant chefs or they're whatever. They're good working guys. Why don't we invite them here, give them a 10-year tax break, let them rebuild our country or grow our nation. So I think in the near term, there'll be a lot of families and people moving to the countries that are open-minded, maybe that support Bitcoin or not, but are just understood that people should be more free to do their things instead of the government being their nanny. So I think in the near term, we're going to see maybe not the U.S. is losing a population to Europe or to Africa or to Asia or to whatever. Maybe regions within the United States, Texas, for instance, are going to say, well, now we're going to accept immigrants tax-free 10 years if they build shops, if they bring revenues to here, if they create jobs, etc. So I think for the next five years, that's what's going to drive most people to Bitcoin-friendly places. Because when you move to some place like that, he says he's tax-free for 10 years. People who won a lot of money in Bitcoin, who got rich over the, the past 10 years, they don't want to pay. They don't want to pay tax to Europe or to United States. So they're going to be moving to those regions, and then you could see other cities. Well, Texas is doing much fine than us. Their GDP is growing 10% because of that. We need to copy to copy that. So I think that's going to be the main driver for the five, the next five years. And I'm not only talking about Bitcoin. I'm talking about the mentality that we don't need to be government so controlled by governments. We can have our own schools, our own health system. We can have private roads and we can go from there. I also think that uh, freedom is hopefully, I see it, maybe I'm dreaming too much, but uh, hopefully on the rise. Uh, I, I see uh, the, the, the internet. Yeah. It, it goes a little bit worse before going on the rise. I think we, we still have a, a, a step to, to move, moving to the socialist side. Is, is the CBDC one part of that? Yeah, sure. Definitely. Huge part. It, it's, for me, a CBDC is often also like um, the, the last straw of the, the fiat system. Because it's like the, 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 the They argue like, oh, we have to have better control of the of the US dollar. Uh, of the US dollar, we have to have better control of the fiat system. We want that better, that better, and we have to compete with with in the new digital world. Even though all the fiat currencies are already kind of digital, the, I think how many percentage is like five percent, ten percent, fifteen percent is cash, like actual physical cash, and everything no, else is two percent. Two percent. Wow. Uh, so. What does it bring? Like it's 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 just more control <laughs> and a fancy new name. <laughs> But how long do you think it's, this is going to last until people realize mm, it was a trap? It will be interesting to see. It's like no clue how, how long uh, people will. will see. I, hopefully not long. But some some people are really ignorant. <laughs> It's not about ignorance. My mother is PhD in economy from the Massachusetts Institute of whatever. He studied in Boston. She studied in Boston. And she, she sees some value in gold, would never invest in gold. Uh, she, in her mind, if the governments crumble, if the fiat system crumbles, then we're going to go back to the Stone Ages. That's what's in her mind. Well, if we don't have the countries to, to, to believe in, Then we have nothing to back us. It's not worth having Bitcoin or gold. Those are also going to be valued at zero. That's what she thinks. So I think it's a little bit of that slave mentality that we talked. We need this new generation to come forward and to, to, to truly change stuff. It's not going to be people who are in their 40s, 50s, 60s. It's a minor part of those guys who were brought in under the fiat system that will be able to break free. It's the minority. It's mo most on the hands of the new generation. So I think it can take 15 years, 
so we can well, have a bitcoin uh, as the, the the biggest asset and uh, as the most i'm not say day to day transactions but backing the day to day transactions that's what the banks own that's what the the, the companies own they can circulate their apple dollars yes but they are backed by bitcoin they're backed by mm. lands yeah. they're they're backed by the the co the the, gov the the revenue of the company or whatever but not by fiat anymore it's going to take some 15 years mm. i love it a lot um when, when we talk about uh the, those bigger macro trends uh the, the the one question that like people always ask me like where's the price going like one year two years and, and i'm always like i'm i'm really not that interested in, in the price I'm, I'm i'm sorry to say uh but new newbies are just like really interested in in the price and uh, i also see it with with youtube when i, I put price things and i i think only did a line in few videos because i'm really not interested in it but they tend to have a higher click through rate people like oh price oh let's let's see that video where there's some price action going but yeah yeah go go ahead we all we shouldn't uh, lie to our public to our viewers 90 percent of people i know that are hardcore bitcoiners today they entered because of grid i don't I, i don't think that's a bad thing i think grid is part of the human nature it's not something inherently negative Uh, but once you get into Bitcoin and you study that for, I don't know, six months, a year, you realize it's not about the price. It's, it depends on what stage of the cycle of the adopt cycle. I'm not saying the four year cycle of the adoption cycle. We are as a society, as a whole, because the fiat is a scam. It's clearly a scam. I don't know if it's going to last for another five years or for another 20 years, but It's going to break eventually. Are going to people go back to the gold standard? They're going to be using gold and silver coins? I have no idea. I don't think that people who are 20 years old, 30 years old, 15 years old, are going to be using fucking gold coins in 15 years. So there's going to be another way. So I think that a lot of Bitcoiners say that Tether and USD coin, stable coins, are the, the, the gateway drugs for crypto and for Bitcoin. And I don't, not, I don't think that's true. If your transactions in US dollar, whether it's Tether, USDC coin, or JP Morgan bank account, you're a believer of the fiat system. You trust them. So I don't see how that it's even related to crypto. I don't think it should be even go on CoinGecko and CoinMarketCap because those are, those are completely different things. It can, it can be uh, seized by the government. It can be seized by the administration. It can be seized by Tether company, by Circle company at any time. And you cannot do anything against that. So there's nothing in crypto in that. I, I can discuss, uh, it, we, we could spend hours discussing if Ethereum is crypto or if it's better or worse than Bitcoin. Uh, at least it's a crypto. At least it's somehow decentralized. Uh, but when we're talking about Tether and USDC coin, there's no way to defend that. It's, it's fiat money in another, another different color of banknotes. So I don't think that maybe Ethereum is a pathway to Bitcoin. You start in Ethereum, you spend five, where, five, you go to the DeFi yields, you get some rook pools, you lose money there. They change the, the policy, the monetary policy to be ultrasound. And then you say, well, that's not what I signed up for. I wanted decentralized. I, I, I wanted my nodes to be able to say if the rules can change, the inflation change or not. And that's not what's happening here. So I think Ethereum is a gateway drug to Bitcoin, but not stable coins. I, I, I love the sign. Ethereum is a gateway drug to, to Bitcoin. <laughs> uh, but I see also the, the stable coins. Uh, it, it's really why are they in all the coin market caps and, and, and the, the likes? Because also uh, there's a Uh, uh, market dominance ratio always like how much market dominance has Bitcoin and I like to look at the market dominance ratio with excluded the the, um, the stable coins because they're not yeah. even into the calculation you can make an argument that Ethereum is in the calculation all the altcoins are in the calculation but <laughs> why are we calculating 
part of the fiat system <laughs> into the uh, in the calculation it, it, it just doesn't make sense if you want to calculate against the fiat system yes this this makes sense it's a small percentage where bitcoin has a dominance it's like uh, i don't know <laughs> what, what percentage the bitcoin has against all the the fiat it's a really small one but uh it, it just doesn't make sense to to mix those those things up yeah, yeah and if you think it through for example dogecoin there's no way a bitcoin maxi can argue saying, oh, this is a scam, this is not a cryptocurrency, their monetary policy is, is invalid. It's impossible because it's 99.5% the, the code is based on uh, Litecoin, which was based on Bitcoin. So it's the same code. They have a, a large uh, number of miners. <coughs> so we can discuss if there's a future for Dogecoin or if not, we can discuss why it hasn't been updated the code in the past seven years, etc. So I, I think it's worthless. But no Bitcoiner can say that uh, it shouldn't exist or it, it's a gamble, it's risky, it's just a token like Shiba or whatever. No, it's a cryptocurrency. It may have value. It may be only a test net like Litecoin used to be for Bitcoin. Uh, but it exists. There's miners working on that. There's proof of work. Like on tokens, there's nothing to be discussed there, mate. It's like you're buying a T-shirt that has been autographed by the player that you like. That's what you're buying. You're buying a collectible. There's no real value in it. There's no way to for you to personally check the database because you depend on Ethereum, you depend on Arbitrum, you depend on Polygon. There are hundreds of other things points of failures that you cannot control. So uh, those, are, those are not cryptocurrencies. So I think we should exclude from CoinMarketCap on CoinGecko the stable coins and the tokens. The tokens are a completely different thing. They don't have their own blockchain. They don't have their own miners. It's not a cryptocurrency. This makes a lot of sense. Uh, and I'm, I was one and a half years, two years ago, I was really against all the altcoins. And I'm still am, but the thing that changed for me uh, is that I I don't hate against them anymore. I'm just seeing them as one participant in the in the market, uh, and I just don't speak about them because I have no interest in them. Uh, and if if a good friend of mine asks me if I should if he should invest in that and that, I always answer like, do your own research. I would not do it, but do your own research. Uh, and uh, I'm more, way more libertarian than, than back then because I'm like, if those truly don't have any value, they will go to zero at some point in time because the free market uh, is, is, is rational over, over the long run. But Robin, think about uh, development. If we did not have the EVM, the Ethereum virtual machine, to build everything from scratch on Bitcoin, the BitVM or whatever is coming here, it would take much longer. Since we have this open test net with multiple layers, two and whatever they are using, or, or federations, or I don't know what they use exactly, but we can take some of that that we see, well, the ZK stuff they're doing, let's implement that on Bitcoin. The EVM is doing good, so let's implement that on Bitcoin. So I think it as a test net, and test net should be worth something, otherwise, Nobody will develop on that. Nobody will try to hack it. So I, I see the altcoins, especially the Ethereum ecosystem, as a test net for what you can do in Bitcoin, maybe not today, but in two year time. Uh, I, I love that view on, uh, view on, on, on altcoins. Um, slowly we get in, into the end routine uh, as we come to the end of the time uh, already. Um, what are you currently uh, passionate about besides Bitcoin? Like what, what are you doing? Uh, or learning about or uh, doing as an activity or whatever, uh, what you're passionate about besides uh, Bitcoin? Well, I have two kids, a girl, eight year old, a boy, two year old. And uh, every time I think about the traditional education that I had as a upper middle class in Brazil, I think of uh, how much we I don't know. I'm not going to sell the, the, I'm not going to say that the time was lost, but was not used at the, 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 the maximum it could be to develop the kids, to develop kids like me 30 years ago. So I'm always trying to, to study and to learn. My, my wife is a psychiatrist. So sometime we discussed things like that. 
how we how can we help kids to develop their full potential without trying to be so much like father and mother and school yeah you have to do this you have to that way you have to learn math that way so i'm always interested on how we can uh, uh, make those kids go to the higher of their potential without being like uh, the, the pain in the ass that's telling them, no, you need to go to, to school. No, you need to lear learn how to play tennis or another sport. You need how to do that. I think I, I'm always interested on in how we can uh, uh, make kids accelerate their growth and their learning curve. I'm always interested in that. So I, I read a lot of psychology or positive psychology and psychiatry books and stuff like that. Love it. For me to be um, a better yeah. fan. A better fighter, basically. It's it's uh, I guess the the most important job you you, you can do right now. <laughs> so, True. Uh, I, I, I love it a lot. Um, we have an end routine in the podcast where the previous guest is asking a question for the next guest uh, without knowing who actually the next guest is. Uh, it's always an interesting uh, format because uh, this is the one question I don't control and it's the one question uh, that is not suited to the guest. Uh, but it's always something uh, funny coming up or funny or interesting or something new coming out. Um, and the question for you is, how do we get more women in Bitcoin? Ooh. Side note on this question, uh, it did not came from a woman. <laughs> okay, I need, I think we need an example. Some, someone young, like the Taylor Swift girl that girls love and have a deep connection with her. And once... She doesn't need to be a Bitcoin maxi, anything like that. But once she tells her audience, well, I'm investing 5% of my fortune in Bitcoin. I'm time locking that shit for 20 years. I don't need that money. If it goes to zero, it goes. But it's going to be for my kids in 20 year time. Because I don't know if my managers, my banks and my husband, whatever, will be able to, to take care of them. But I know that being time locked for 20 years and only they, they have the, the code to the access of the, to the bank where the seed is written, that's going to be my inheritance to them. So I think that's going to trigger on the other women around the world, especially the younger generation. Hmm, maybe I should be doing something like that for myself. I don't be, want to be dependent on the banks, on my husband or my fathers or whatever. I want to be able to provide for my kids in 20 year time. So I'm going to start doing this trust fund with time locked. I, even I won't have access. If somebody comes with a gun on my head, sorry, I cannot, it's time locked. It's going to take 20 years. So I think when some people like Taylor Swift move to that side, it doesn't need to be a Bitcoin maxi, but it's going to be open the path for more women to adopt. They need an example. Uh, very, very true. Uh, I, I love the answer. Um, we're coming to the end of, uh, end of the podcast. Uh, before I let you go, uh, where can people find you? Where can people uh, read stuff about you? Where can people ask you questions? So, so uh, I, I'm a full time writer and analyst at Coin Telegraph. So you can ju just log into the Coin Telegraph website or Coin Telegraph slash Marcel Pitchman, B O Marcel Pitchman. You're gonna find me there on the Coin Telegraph website. So I do a daily analysis. I do Bitcoin, I do a little bit about altcoins, but not on a, a technical analysis, more, more fundamentals. So I, I won't be shilling any altcoins, you can be sure. If I'm talking about Ethereum, I'm talking about the ETFs, I'm talking about futures, open interest and options and stuff, trading, stuff like that. So you can find me on Cointelegraph. Perfect. And uh, thank you for being on and for everyone watching. Uh, I'll be back tomorrow with another episode. Bye-bye. Thank you, Robin. Bye-bye.